I am Rashmi Gopinath. I'm a partner at Microsoft Ventures. Um, I've been around since the fund started about a couple years back. Prior to this, I did corporate investing at Intel Capital. Um, I had a similar focus there as well, primarily focused on, on enterprise B2B investments, which includes cloud infrastructure, uh, data analytics, AI machine learning, cybersecurity, business SaaS, DevOps, IoT. So pretty broad focus for us on the B2B side. Um, between my time at Intel and Microsoft, I've been at two startups um, running global business development for Couchbase and for Blue Data. And uh, prior to Intel Capital, I was in product development and product marketing roles at Oracle and GE. So um, core enterprise background, it's, it's been um, a fun experience at Microsoft Ventures. We're now known as M12. Um, we had a rebrand about a month back, so I'm going to refer to us as M12 more often than um, Microsoft Ventures. We've uh, closed about 60 investments in the last two years, so the fund has been pretty active. Um, I have worked on 10 deals um, in the process of looking at another few deals. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is a key priority area for Microsoft, as well as a key investment area for M12. Um, we believe there are a number of industries that can be um, completely disrupted and um, a lot of great innovative technologies can be brought to bear through um, these, these solutions. To answer about how um, M12 is set up, you're completely right in that um, CBCs are set up in, um, in different formats uh, with different org structures and different mandates. Um, at M12, the way we're structured is uh, we're a corporate investment arm, but not necessarily a strategic investment arm, meaning that the investment decision is fairly autonomous and independent and does not require a business unit sponsorship or any commercial agreement with Microsoft um, prior to us investing in the company. The um, financial returns and profile of the company is uh, going to be paramount for us as we evaluate an investment. And of course, for all the deals that we look at, the first question we ask them is what value can Microsoft provide to this company? Um, enterprise B2B is, is the obvious one where Microsoft has um, the strongest presence in the enterprise space. And so we can drive a lot of value to the startups in our portfolio through engagements with our product teams, as well as engagements with our go-to-market teams. Um, we connect them with our sales teams. We connect them with our channel teams. We host a number of customer days where we bring in Microsoft um, customers, and these are the top C-level decision makers, and offer our portfolio companies the um, opportunity to, to pitch to these companies, which is fantastic. We also help our portfolio companies um, get qualified for the one commercial partner program, which is basically a co-sell partner program with Microsoft. Um, and this enables them to work alongside our sales teams and sell again to these Fortune 500 companies, thereby significantly reducing the sales cycle as well as the, uh, the friction of getting into these customers. So if we look at the overall mandate uh, for M12, it's pretty simple. Um, one is um, to bring back interesting signals um, to Microsoft of what is happening in the startup ecosystem. What are technology trends that we as a company should be aware of? Um, how do we look out five, seven years out into the horizon and bring those, um, those valuable nuggets back to our product teams so that they're more aware of what is that next disruption or what is that next innovation happening and how can we partner and work together with these startups to make sure that we can build a more comprehensive solution that would well appeal to our customers. Um, financial um, strength of the company, like I said, is going to be paramount and that's how we get measured is similar to um, any other venture fund is going to be based on the um, exit valuation and the exit profile of these companies. When it comes to um, AI and ML companies, I would say, um, from a broader mandate perspective, we look to invest in companies in series A through C stages. Um, our check size is anywhere from two to 10. With AI and ML, just given how nascent the market is, um, I would say there is a higher uh, tendency to go in at the early stages of so series A and B, preferably for these companies, um, just given that um, 
the market is still very new. And so um, many of these, um, the companies that are focused in this space may still be in their infancy, but we do like them to have some uh, product market fit identified. So early traction with some customers would be great. Um, having at least a few referenceable customers that we can uh, validate the technology with would be great. Um, and then we can always bring in folks from um, the Microsoft uh, product teams that are focused on on AI as well to help on the product and the go-to-market side. Um, and the reason why we ask for companies to have at least some initial product market fit is primarily because post investment, uh, if we are looking to help them on the go-to-market side, the scale at which we can help them is going to be pretty large. And so we want these companies to have at least some success um, with a handful of customers that our sales and go-to-market teams can then go in and replicate at other accounts. Um, so in terms of how we typically work with um, accelerators and incubators, given that you come in fairly early in the process, so you're probably looking at pre-seed or seed stage companies, um, we uh, have a pretty strong relationship with um, most of the accelerators and incubators um, worldwide. So I, for example, work pretty closely with, um, with the Alchemist and with Plug and Play and with um, other institutions um, being aware of what are the companies in their cohort and portfolio um, and track these companies that might be interesting for us. When it comes to AI and ML specifically, I would say I am more interested in the vertical applications of AI. I have other colleagues that look at the horizontal application. On the horizontal side, we just need to be cognizant and aware of um, any competitive overlaps with Microsoft given that we're building a lot of horizontal capabilities as well. So we want to make sure that the companies that we invest in will be complementary to what Microsoft offers. On the vertical side, I would say there is um, a less probability of overlaps given that we are looking to partner with companies that bring more industry and sector specific expertise that we can work together with. So these could be across a, a variety of different verticals like healthcare, financial services, retail, manufacturing, um, you name it, every industry is ripe for disruption um, through really smart applications of, uh, of machine learning and deep learning. And so um, those companies for me are, are pretty interesting in terms of how can they um, bring a new wave of thinking from the old manual slow process and using more of these automated ways to uh, bring more intelligence into these systems. I'll talk about my portfolio first and then um, just broader from the M12 portfolio. So in my portfolio, I have two companies um, that use uh, AI and machine learning. One is a company called TACT AI, um, which is at the intersection of AI and CRM. So the biggest challenge that um, any CRM platform today has, be it uh, Salesforce or Dynamics, is that the application is, um, is more suited for a client server-based uh, workflow so works best on computers um, but if you look at the end users or sales reps um, they're constantly on the move and so the the, the biggest challenge with uh, with CRM is that uh, you can't get data put into the CRM at the time when it is most relevant so if I am a sales rep I come out of a sales meeting um, I'm not going to pull out my computer and type my notes right there. I typically go in at the end of the week, end of the month, um, and put in relevant data in. But the challenge comes in is um, it's not um, going to be as comprehensive and as rich as if it were captured um, at the time when it was most relevant, either during my meeting or right after my meeting. And so what TAX provides is uh, a voice and text-enabled uh, digital assistant interface on top of CRM. So it works with Salesforce today. And so uh, the sales reps um, user experience would be, I would use an Alexa or a Cortana or a Siri or tax own native application to capture my notes from the meeting and say that um, I had this meeting with Sear. Um, these were my relevant notes. It would prompt me back. The assistant would prompt me back and ask me, do you want to update the opportunity to this? Um, do you think you want to set up a follow-up meeting in about a week? If I say yes, it would, uh, go into my calendar and update my uh, calendar to set up a follow-up meeting. So it provides this really nice interface where um, almost every sales rep has now their own assistant to work with. Um, from a management standpoint, um, 
sales managers or executives can again use the TACT app to say, show me my top opportunities um, that are going to be closing in the next 30 days. And it will pull out that information and put it into a nice chart and a, a graphical um, uh, user experience and provide all of that information back. So uh, the net result of this is it drives um, a significant amount of CRM adoption among the end users. And it also puts in really rich information um, right at the time and it's more relevant. And so any insights or analytics that uh, customers are looking to run off their CRM platforms is now more relevant um, instead of it just being um, like haphazard kind of information captured at different points in time. So um, the CRM platforms find it to be extremely complementary because um, one, it, it makes the ROI so much more justified uh, for the spend that many customers spend on, on their CRM platforms, which is typically um, millions of dollars. Um, and it uh, provides a more, I would say, millennial um, favorable user experience to the sales community, which is increasingly more voice and text um, enabled than um, being more computer enabled. So that's one. Uh, another one that um, I have invested in is a company called Unravel Data. Uh, and they use AI in the application performance management space. So um, it's more specific for big data applications. So if you think about the big data application stack, you have Hadoop and you have Spark, you have Kafka, you have Storm, you have Flink. There's a variety of different projects, super fragmented. And from a DevOps perspective, if I'm a DevOps engineer looking to understand why my Spark job failed or why my Hive query was running slow. I have no idea because there's 15 or 20 different systems and I don't know where to go and start looking for it. So what um, Unravel does is it uh, uses the contextual information to build a knowledge graph on the AI application stack uh, to provide an automated way to identify these are the top three reasons on why an application was running slow or why a query was failing. And if you put it in a self-healing uh, mode, it will go in and fix it for you. So from a DevOps perspective, now I don't have to worry about um, my application stack issues. I can either let the system handle it by itself, or it can send me, here are the top two reasons on why it's happening, and here's what I can do to fix it. And so it makes the DevOps person look like a hero because now they're able to manage this really, really large cluster, which is, typically hundreds and thousands of nodes. Um, you need fewer people to manage this entire system and they can focus their time on the more complex and challenging pieces and not worry about um, the, uh, the resource or the application contention issues. So that is an example of applying AI more on the um, application stack uh, on the IT uh, side of the house. Some of the other AI investments that we have done um, as a fund, I'm not gonna pick all of them because the list is too big. Uh, one is um, a company called Bonsai that we just announced uh, that Microsoft will be acquiring the company um, yesterday, which is in the um, uh, deep, uh, deep learning space uh, for providing a platform for engineers to be able to um, uh, build these deep learning platforms without having a lot of expertise. So uh, more applications around industrials and robotics, and they've been working with folks like ABB and Siemens, um, specifically on the robotics use cases and how to build these deep learning applications without um, having a significant team that can build it. Um, one of the other companies that uh, we've invested in is a company called Element AI, which is uh, based in uh, Toronto. It was founded by Joshua Bengio, who's one of the um, founding uh, thought leaders in deep learning and they're building a variety of different um, AI application layers that can be applied to different industries and verticals so more of the Palantir model uh, for deep learning. Uh, we have um, I would say a, another six or seven companies in the AI and machine learning um, portfolio as part of M12. Some of them are in the fraud detection space. We have one in the identity um, management space um, so it's a, it's a variety of different applications. So there's obviously, if you look at it from a broader investment perspective, um, there's a number of different industries or verticals where um, AI can be applied. 
but some of them I would consider them as the low hanging fruit, meaning that the market is large enough, um, the pain point is very real and it's active now and that needs to be fixed. Um, so some of the ones where we've already seen, I would say some level of maturity in the applications of AI and machine learning would be uh, retail, for example. Uh, we already have a number of companies um, that already use AI and deep learning for recommendations and personalizations of um, their, uh, um, their websites, as well as um, sending relevant emails and communications to customers that are more specific to the kind of purchases that they would likely make, not necessarily what they've made in the past, but more of um, kind of the Netflix or the Amazon model is because you watch this, you might want to watch this, or because you bought this, you might want to buy this. Um, and that's getting smarter and smarter. So I would say retail is the easy one. Uh, financial services is another one, which um, I mean, we've seen some applications for it, but there's definitely a lot more applications, both in the consumer banking as well as in the commercial banking sector. So whether it's um, using AI and deep learning for identifying fraud, identifying risk profiles of customers, um, using it from a credit scoring perspective to make sure that um, certain customers are going to be um, uh, uh, pre-recommended for these offers. And um, when they walk into a bank or an ATM, the person on the other side already knows everything that they need to know about that customer. And so the user experience is definitely um, a lot more, um, I would say, elegant and more more seamless, um, while also using the um, the text cognition piece of it uh, from a customer service standpoint. So more and more banks are moving away from physical banking into more of mobile banking. And so if I think of uh, BFA is working on their digital assistant called Erica, so you can do all of your transactions um, that you um, need to interact with the bank over your uh, phone or over an Alexa or any sort of voice interface. You can have um, this digital assistant transfer money into different accounts. You can have them, uh, if you lose your wallet, you just call into it and say, I lost my wallet. And it would know that you're trying to go in and shut certain accounts and uh, let the bank know that there might be a possibility of fraud. So all of that intelligence is now getting built into it. Uh, customer service across different verticals is another one where we've seen a number of um, companies that have already adopted AI and machine learning. So um, these are systems that are more moving away from um, either an automated calling system or a physical call center into more of the chat bots that you see that you can uh, talk to them about what are the issues that you're having and it will use um, the, the text uh, perception capabilities and cognitive capabilities to give you the right response um, based on the issue that you're having. And only if it gets into the really complicated or challenging tasks is when it gets assigned to an actual person. Um, on the manufacturing side, we've seen a number of use cases and applications where uh, AI can be used to identify um, what, um, what pieces of the hardware may fail in the future. And so predictive maintenance, uh, predictive um, uh, remediation of these issues is, um, is something that I've seen a number of startups work, uh, work at. And these could be either using sensor technology, so gathering data from sensors to predict which of these pieces may fail, or it could be based on computer vision capabilities. So um, having cameras watch these devices and then using the uh, computer cognitive capabilities on the vision side to predict uh, the life um, the life cycle of, of these pieces is another one. Um, another one that uh, again is um, I would say mature to a large degree is on the facial recognition side. So Facebook obviously has been doing this for many years now, but we're seeing a lot of applications for this on the smart city initiatives where um, the local state governments and federal governments are using these um, technologies from a security standpoint um, to either identify people of interest or to uh, proactively monitor um, certain situations and to know like when um, there needs to be a call to action for, for something that may happen in the future. Um, so healthcare is another big one uh, for us. There's already been a number of applications where um, AI and machine learning is being used to 
predict hospital readmission rates, um, to predict uh, how do you proactively offer care to um, prevent certain health situations. So we've seen companies like 23andMe and Ancestry offer uh, the genetic testing databases where you now know your health profile and what you may have uh, the tendency um, uh, to acquire in the future. We're also seeing applications of computer vision um, and deep learning on the radiology side, where a number of these images can now be analyzed by machines um, to predict um, or to figure out if uh, there is a tumor or there is like some something that needs uh, further looking into uh, without requiring the radiologist time for some of the, the easy piece of the low hanging fruit. So there's, a, I would say, a number of technologies that are in the human assist um, space for now, uh, before getting into the fully automated space. Um, so in the fully automated, automated space, they would not require a human intervention, but today I would say a lot of the technologies have the human in the loop, just because the data that we have, we have been gathering today is not sufficient enough to get to an error rate that would be low enough where it would not require human intervention. So there's, I would say, plenty of ground still to be covered in each of these areas, which is why from an investment perspective, we're all super excited about uh, what is to come. Um, the key obviously is going to be, uh, specifically if you're looking for supervised data learning, is how do you make sure that you have access to the data, which is one of the questions that we ask many of the startups that we meet is um, obviously everybody wants to solve these these big problems but if you don't have access to the data how do you train these systems which is um, what gets us to the other interesting part on the unsupervised learning systems which are harder to build um, but i would say the uh, the data needs for those systems is smaller than what you would need on the supervised side the first and the biggest one is um, don't don't say that you're AI just for the sake of saying you're AI. Um, there's way too many companies uh, that we see on a daily basis um, that claim to be AI, but really have um, more of, I would say, analytical or pattern matching technologies, which is not really AI. And so if you're an AI startup looking to raise money, um, you need to... Um, completely anticipate in the first five minutes that you will be asked more questions into specifically what that technology entails. Um, the other key point would be to ensure that if you're building an AI system, you need to have a team uh, with the right level of expertise that can build these systems. So you can't just have a handful of software engineers uh, building these AI platforms, which requires a pretty level deep, um, uh, deep learning expertise on the AI side. And so the companies that we have historically funded, and I'm not saying it's a requirement, but many of them have uh, people that have had deep learning expertise in the past or PhDs in uh, statistical uh, modeling or physics or mathematics um, that know how to build these systems. The other key question that I just touched upon is also on the training data side is if you're building an AI system, you can't come in and assume that you're gonna get access to the data from a Facebook or from a Microsoft or a Google because that's not going to happen. Um, these systems um, typically have large needs of data and when you're asking your customers or you're asking these large companies to share data, um, that, is, that is precious. Um, they typically use the data to build out their own AI systems and it's not one that will be shared with other third-party vendors. And so you either need to have access to your own proprietary data or have the ability to leverage um, data that is publicly available. But when you're using data that is publicly available, that same data set will also be available to other people. And so unless you have these proprietary models um, that can take advantage of that data, um, you need to make sure that you have a defensible IP moat around what it is that you're building. Um, so that would be interesting. There's also a number of um, AI companies that are going the open source model. And so for those companies, um, the key question that I and any other investor would ask would be around uh, monetization and how do you plan to monetize um, in the future? The same goes for um, companies that have closed source models, but not a clear go-to-market or a business plan is who is going to buy it and who's going to pay for it and why would they pay for it? 
Um, so if the same capabilities are available um, through a Google or a Facebook, um, through one of their APIs, or through a cloud platform, um, for example, Microsoft and AWS have been uh, putting out a lot of their APIs that developers can then build on and they don't have to pay for it. And so if, if it is available from one of these alternative solutions, then what are you going to be doing to maintain your competitive edge? Um, at the end of the day, monetization is going to be top of mind for any investor um, because I mean, that's what the company will need to do to, uh, to grow and scale. So that would be another one. Um, and then lastly, I would say is if you can also get some strong advisors on your team uh, that have these, um, these areas of expertise. So for example, if you're building an AI platform in retail, for example, um, try to get somebody as an advisor that has either built these uh, products at um, a large retail um, customer or would be a potential buyer or a decision maker um, at one of these companies. It adds a lot more credibility to your team, especially in that early phase of when you're trying to raise money. Um, and it also gives some comfort to the investors knowing that um, you've thought through the problem, you've, you've built a robust team that can deliver and can advise uh, these companies as they look to grow and scale. Those would be some of the things that, um, that I would suggest. So I would say the, the biggest one uh, goes back to access to data. And that's where, um, I mean, I've met a lot of early stage AI companies and the challenge is that they have the right uh, set of people to build these products, but without having access to the data, it becomes a chicken and egg situation. Is if you're trying to then sell to a customer saying that, hey, I have this amazing uh, product that's going to offer um, a, a risk detection or a fraud detection score for your financial transactions, um, the first question they're going to ask is, what is the um, accuracy of the system? And unless you've tested it on enough data, um, you don't have that. And so um, I would say one of the, 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 the things that, that is holding many of these um, technologies back is access to the data. And one thing that I think might be interesting or helpful in the future is uh, what I see at the intersection of blockchain and AI. So using blockchain technologies, if um, there can be different participants in this distributed architecture that will be willing to share um, access to the data, either um, in order to build a better system or for some sort of uh, a payment mechanism that can help solve some of this uh, data, I would say silo issues um, that, I mean, companies like Facebook and Google and Microsoft do not, ha do not face or do not have, but for the um, general population that will open up access to a significant amount of data without, um, uh, without requiring them to having to license the data from uh, a certain big company. Um, the other, I would say, um, uh, accelerating factor would definitely be the um, increasing education and awareness of AI and deep learning technologies. So there's a number of universities and academic institutions that are now offering deep learning and artificial intelligence and machine learning as courses. And so there are more people that are coming out with, um, with the skills and expertise in building these products and platforms. I just came back from Toronto last week and met with um, the University of Toronto and the University of Waterloo um, and um, Montreal that um, obviously have the academic uh, professors that are thought leaders in the space, but they're also spending a lot of time in building labs and in making sure that they're offering enough courses to students um, that can then be experts in, in this area. Uh, because one of the things that's holding us back is um, just lack of talent and lack of resources in, in building these systems. Um, every AI company that I know of is um, starving to bring on best engineers and best people to build these systems. And um, the more folks that we have graduating out of colleges with these degrees, um, I, would, I would say the faster we're going to see some of these uh, technologies accelerate. And the last one I would say, um, not wanting to um, put in a, a Microsoft angle to this, but uh, from a adoption or a usage perspective, um, 
the cloud platforms are doing a lot to provide infrastructure to build these platforms. And I would say that once these become more mainstream, you would see a number of developers and startups that can leverage these cloud solutions from an infrastructure standpoint. Because the big challenge is that these AI and deep learning platforms are extremely resource intensive. You need a number of compute resources, you need a number of storage resources to be able to run these platforms effectively. And doing it on premises means that you have to set up a large data center or a really large rack. And so having these resources available in the cloud, in many cases subsidized at a significantly um, heavy discount, will make it easier for a number of developers and companies to then build on um, these infrastructure offerings uh, from the application standpoint. Our portfolio companies, we obviously have a dedicated business development team that helps them connect with the different product teams and go-to-market teams in Microsoft. Um, access to the data is going to really depend on um, the team that owns the data. Um, if you're looking at office data, for example, um, most of that data is PII data. Um, and that is not something that um, we, based on the customer agreements that we have, that we can willingly share with anybody else, um, primarily from a privacy standpoint. Um, some of the Azure data, I would say, is more anonymized. Um, so if you're looking at like infrastructure consumption data, um, those would be one that um, the teams would be more willing to share than others. It really depends on the team. While we can help influence, the ultimate decision resides on the kind of data that um, our portfolio companies are looking to get access to and on the product team's uh, prerogative on whether they would be willing to share that data or not. Um, we're happy to influence, but we can't guarantee the outcome on the other side. Very few, I would say. Um, one is definitely the one that I highlighted in how do you um, have the data available um, for these AI systems. And so creating these distributed ledgers that um, participants will be willing to put in data that they would like to share for these AI systems um, and either for um, some sort of um, a payment model or just um, people that are willing to share up this information, um, the AI systems can leverage the data. Uh, the other one is on the compute side, again, given just how compute intensive these applications can be, using blockchain to create this distributed um, infrastructure architecture offering where um, the extra compute resources on this distributed network can be leveraged uh, for running AI applications would be interesting. Um, there's applications of AI and blockchain um, as well, but again, I, I haven't seen too many companies um, at either sides of, of, uh, of these technologies, uh, but it would definitely be one that I think will be more and more relevant um, in the next 12 to 18 months. One, um, if, there is a, if there is a way or a possibility to offer this as a service, so if you can satisfy the, the product, um, and offer it on the cloud. Um, marketplaces are a great way to get some of these initial trials going. And so, um, if, for example, if you look at the Azure Marketplace, there's a number of different offerings. They're typically um, organized by sector or by product relevance. And so, um, if uh, this can get highlighted in like the supply chain or the manufacturing side of a marketplace, um, could be Azure, could be AWS or GCP, I think would be a great way to get uh, some of these trials going. You'd be surprised at how many developers at these large um, Fortune 10 or Fortune 50 companies look at these marketplaces to find new products that they can try within the organization. So that would be one. The second would be um, there's all of these industries that I talked about, the CIOs, um, uh, the CTOs of, of all of these companies are looking for technologies that they can use to become more relevant and more cost efficient in the future because disruption is coming in every industry. And many of these folks, if you look at um, recent examples from, um, from say Toys R Us or a GE, for example, many of them that used to be giants in the past will not continue in the future just given how rapidly 
um, digital transformation is changing entire industries. And so all of these folks are worried about their sustainability in the future and what they can do to change things up. And there's a number of forums and events that you'd, you would be able to meet them. And I mean, some cases I even reached out to the CIOs um, and, and tell them that, hey, I have this really interesting technology that can help your business model or help your uh, product initiative going in the future. Do you want to learn more? Um, you would very rarely come across somebody who would say, no, I don't care. In most cases, they'd at least be willing to give you those 10, 15 minutes to hear out uh, what that is. And so I would say that if there are specific industry events or conferences where you would see a congregation of these decision makers come to it, um, definitely take advantage of that. If uh, your companies can get um, some sort of a boot space over here or some way to showcase what it is that they're doing, maybe an event or a session or a panel discussion, that will also help elevate their, their visibility in the industry and make them more aware. Um, I can't tell you of a better time than now when all of these C-level folks are extremely eager and anxious to know about what is that next startup technology that can help their business going forward.